Hello and welcome to my Fortress of New Monsters, the home of all my monster-making experiments. A week ago, I thought that becoming a mad scientist seemed fun, and a fortress where I turned dwarves into vampires and creatures seemed like a great idea. But as you'll see, sometimes things don't go according to plan, even if you stick it out for a decade. I got the idea for the fortress while reading about vampires in the Dwarf Fortress wiki. I knew that toppling a deity statue could get you cursed for my adventure to become a vampire, and I had heard that it was possible for dwarves in fortress mode to suffer the same fate if they happened to throw a tantrum around the wrong statue. And so, when I saw the outdated technique for creating vampires on the vampire wiki page, I wanted to try my hand at updating it, only for dwarves this time. I figured it would be as simple as finding some angry dwarves who are already more prone to tantruming than others, locking them away in a room filled with statues of the deity they worship, only giving them the bare minimum of food and drink, and then waiting for them to crack under the pressure and topple a statue. After establishing new monsters as a place for dwarves to come and work, I began building my first ill-fated dwarf-to-monster conversion chamber. It was set in a pillar up above the surface and had four rooms to lock people in. Each of those rooms came with two additional side rooms that would be used as food and drink stockpiles. The rooms also had access to a central hallway, though the conversion candidates would be blocked off from accessing it by a bridge while the conversion chamber was in operation. Inside each of the rooms, I envisioned statues of whatever deity each candidate worshipped arranged along a wall, ready to be toppled at a moment's notice. With all the essentials theoretically covered, I also had one killer feature for this conversion chamber design, a roof made of bars that would expose each of the candidates to rain, snow, and sunlight so they would accumulate negative thoughts quicker. Unfortunately, I scrapped this design before ever picking out candidates and giving it a proper run, because there was no way to replenish the food or drink supplies, the bridges could be destroyed in a tantrum, and in the process of building it, I had already come up with what I thought was a better and more effective design. That better design called for four 5x5 five five rooms, each positioned above water at the center tile, so that instead of booze, I could build a well in each room, and the candidates would be forced to drink water. It also called for a second layer above the rooms that would give access to each of the rooms through a hatch, which could be used to deliver extra food if the candidates were running low, or dead bodies if they seemed too happy. Once the rooms, the access hatches, and the wells were in place, it was time to pick up candidates who seemed easily annoyed. I spent an hour or two waiting for migrant waves and checking each new dwarf for potential personality defects, but in the end I decided that even if I killed the candidates I picked, instead of inciting a tantrum, there would just be more bodies for the corpse stockpiles that could be found in each room, so there was no harm in starting before I had the perfect dwarves. Ultimately, I ended up with Carol, who easily developed hatreds, Ustuth, who was easily stressed, and Id and Urvad, who had the misfortune of being peasants and nearby. Carol worshipped the god of minerals, Ustuth worshipped the goddess of death, Urvad worshipped the goddess of jewels, and Id worshipped a hoary moment. So six statues of each of those deities were commissioned, and I just prayed that they would be vindictive should one of their statues be toppled. Once the statues and plump helmet barrels were placed in each of the rooms, it was time to send each candidate to the last room they would ever see if they didn't make me happy and piss off a god. For a while I was annoyed, because the fine statues each of them had in their room were lifting the mood a little too much. But I soon found that that happiness could be dampened with the timely delivery of a dead body. This playful back and forth went on for a while, with my dwarves refusing to be sad, and with me dropping dead bodies on them, but eventually that status quo was broken by an ulm that climbed into Urvad's chamber and knocked him down the well and into the water where he died. While a couple seasons of bad memories weren't a lot to replace, I still didn't want to start from square one, so I picked someone who was already sad, Obak, and sent her to take Urvad's place. With the conversion chamber once again filled, I turned my attention to a siege on the surface that produced five new bodies that I could dump on the candidates. But while I horrified them with the bodies of what could have been their long-lost cousins, the fortress had its first tantrum, and it was outside the conversion chamber. Dishmab the weaponsmith was not having a good time, which meant he was perfect. I opened up the south room and swapped id for Dishmab because id was having fun in the room and I couldn't have that. And then I realized I needed Dishmab in the Goddess of Death room in the north, instead of the Hoi Marmot room, and so I swapped him with Ustuth, who worshipped both Marmots and Death, and somewhere along the way Obok died in her well, just like Irvad had in the east room. Only solid, sturdy Carol had stuck it out and persisted in the west room through all that chaos, though she seemed far less hateful than her personality description had made out. Dishmab already seemed to be on edge by the time I captured him, but I just felt like there was something I could do to guarantee that he would have another tantrum and so I found his relatives in the fortress, expelled them, had them killed, and then dropped their bodies into his cell. Is that messed up? 
definitely. Did it work? Not at all. It turned out that in his stressed out state, he didn't really feel anything seeing the dead bodies of his nieces and nephews, and even aside from that, he had already toppled a statue between the time I killed them and the time I dropped them into his room. While the toppled statue was good, the lack of reaction from the Goddess of Death had me questioning how it all worked. After briefly considering the idea that the Goddess of Death was merciful, I eventually realized that I had gotten all twisted around and had thought the out of the statue was the important part, instead of the room the statue was in. This meant I had to make all the rooms temples to their respective deities, which was easy and made the fact that I had missed it all the more annoying. Once I had corrected that, I went back to watching the rooms and waiting for something to happen. Months turned to seasons and seasons turned to years as I watched the rooms and only saw death. Carol's death to a cavefish person, Maffle's death to a cavefish person, and then finally Stukos, who was introduced to the North Room partway through all that dying, and Dishmab both got killed by a cave crocodile. With Stukos's internal rage and Dishmab's history of being the only one to topple a statue, they were my last real shot at getting someone cursed using this setup, and once they were gone, I knew that I would need to come up with a third design. One that would combine easy access to stressful things like the dead bodies in the second design with the locked off and safe from cave crocodile feel of the first design. The third conversion chamber was made up of a main temple room at the center, filled with a checkerboard of statues. To the west was the food stockpile that would keep the people I trapped alive. To the north and south were fortifications, followed by a bridge, followed by more fortifications, followed by a room where I put a couple of captured enemies, so that every time I lowered the bridge, the temple goers I had trapped inside the chamber would start freaking out about being caught in combat, which would hopefully stress them out until they cracked. Once I locked off the chamber, I immediately got to work forcing each dwarf inside to face their own mortality, which had them running into the food stockpile and then back to the temple over and over again. I did this a couple times before deciding I would just leave it running for a little while, until one of the dwarves in the chamber died so that I could hit the remaining dwarves with the double misery of running for their lives while their friend decayed in the corner. That seemed to really bum people out, but not enough to make them do something. I had ghosts toppling statues down in the second conversion chamber, kids throwing tantrums without disturbing the peace, and a widespread food problem that was leading to the death of everyone not in the chamber. But I still persisted in my task, cycling the bridge on and off as I felt the dwarves in the chamber could use it. Eventually, the population outside the chamber grew thin enough that I was nervous the bridge would get stuck open with nobody alive to close it, and so I closed it myself one final time and left the dwarves in the temple to stew on what they had experienced. Nearly two years of in-game time and four hours of my own personal time passed without a single toppling incident. You would think that with the statues packed that close to one another, one would simply need to trip on a shoelace to get cursed with vampirism, but apparently that's not the case. And to make matters worse, as I looked through the thoughts of the dwarves that remained in the conversion chamber, the traumas that I had put them through, designed specifically to tear them down to rock bottom so they would become monsters of themselves, had made them into better people. No longer were they so quick to form hateful opinions, get angry, or ignore the people around them. I had missed my shot to curse Dishmap by not making his room a temple earlier, and now I had improved my dwarves by stressing them out. I guess sometimes things don't go according to plan, but not often do they go completely against it. At least I didn't do anything I regret, like murdering a dwarf's family just to stress him out. Thank you for watching, an extra thank you to those of you who support me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.